Well, welcome everybody. It's great to see you here this morning at Frontline. Glad you uh, joined us here on this Father's Day. And I wanted to start out today, uh, because it's Father's Day, just letting you know I suffer from something known as husband's disease. Or at least that's what my wife affectionately refers to it as. Maybe some of the rest of you suffer from this as well. Husband's disease is basically where I cannot see the thing that I'm looking for that's right in front of my face until my wife finds it for me. Does anybody else have that? Does anybody else suffer from that? Uh, Literally, car keys is the perfect example. It will be like time for me to leave the house and I can't find the car keys. And so I'm looking everywhere. I'm, I'm frantically looking for the car keys. Now it's five minutes past when I should have left the house. I can't find the car keys. Anxiety is going up. And so I will call to my wife, from uh, who's in another part of the house, I'll say, Carrie, where are the car keys? I can't find the car keys. And she will answer, did you check the hooks? We have these hooks right by the door where we're supposed to put the car keys. And I will say, of course I checked the hooks. That's the first place I checked was the hooks. I can't find my car keys. And at that moment, she will come from the other part of the house and she will walk over to the hooks, which by the way, makes me very nervous when she does that. (laughs) I start to immediately start to panic when she goes. And she will go over to the hooks and she will look and go, here you go, here's your car keys. They're right there, right where they're supposed to be. That's husband's disease. That's what that is. One time, no joke, I was looking for the pickles. I had the refrigerator door open. I was staring at the shelf where the pickles were and I'm like, where are the pickles? I can't find the pickles. Did somebody eat all the pickles? She reaches her hand in front of me, grabs the pickles and pulls them out and hands them to me. Like, wow, thank you, honey. What would I do without you? I mean... Husband's disease. And and I don't know why it is that I can't see the thing that's right in front of my face and somehow she can. But but really the problem isn't that I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing it. It's just I'm overlooking it, right? My brain just isn't focusing on the thing it needs to focus on. And so I'm just, it's there. I'm just overlooking the thing that I'm looking for. I wonder as we think about the text we're going to look at this morning, I wonder if we do that with people. Are are there people in our daily lives, are there people in our society, in our world, that we just overlook? It's it's not that they're not there. It's not that that we don't see them. They're right in front of our faces. It's just we don't, our brains don't focus on the thing that that we really need to focus on. And so we just sort of overlook certain people. Um, If you've been joining us over the last few weeks, you know we're in a series, week three, in fact, of a series called Wars and Walls. We're talking about the biblical story of Nehemiah and every week just walking through another chunk of it. And so if you were here last week, you know we talked about how do you respond to an attack from the outside. That's what Nehemiah was dealing with. So Nehemiah has been given permission by King Artaxerxes, the Persian king who is in charge of the whole land. He's been given uh, permission and he's also been given supplies to return to the city of Jerusalem and unite with the people and they are rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem and they are rebuilding the city, rebuilding the temple and and so uh, things are going well. The people are united, they're working hard and last week we talked about these other groups of people from the outside begin to attack them and begin to threaten them. And so we talked about how do you deal with an attack from the outside. Today, we're looking at chapter five of Nehemiah and it's much more of an inside job. Literally, it's so much of an inside job that it's happening, what's happening is happening right underneath Nehemiah's nose. He just doesn't see it. He just doesn't see what's happening with his own people inside his, the walls of Jerusalem. And so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to jump in. So this is Nehemiah 5, verse 1 begins like this. About this time, some of the men and their wives raised a cry of protest against their fellow Jews. They were saying, we have such large families, we need more food to survive. Others said, we have mortgaged our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get food during the famine. And others said, we have had to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay our taxes. We belong to the same family as those who are wealthy, and our children are just like theirs. Yet we must sell our children into slavery just to get enough money to live. We have already sold some of our daughters, and we are helpless to do anything about it, for our fields and our vineyards are already mortgaged to others." And so there's a situation that's happening here. And so uh, just to help us kind of walk through and so you understand what's taking place, imagine 
that you live in, in this time and, and you have been part of this return and this rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and you, it's the midst of a famine. There is a famine that has hit the whole land. And so grain is in short supply. Everybody needs it. It's a staple that everybody needed and a few people have it. Most people don't. And so what's happening is the wealthier Israelites are, are loaning money to their fellow Israelites, but what they're doing is they're loaning it at a huge interest rate. And so they're sort of capitalizing on the famine that's happening on the land, and, and they're making lots of money by loaning money so, these, so their fellow Israelites can buy grain, but at a huge interest rate. But that's not even the worst part. What's happening is if, if you owned a field, if you owned land or a vineyard at this time, you basically had to pay a tax to King Artaxerxes, the Persian king. Remember, he's in charge of the whole land. So even though he's allowed them to return, he's given them permission to return and rebuild the city, uh, imagine that you own your own land, but you have to pay taxes, a land tax to the king of Persia for your land. And so what's happening is you're getting farther and farther behind on your payments and, and the loan that you took and you can't pay the interest back to get grain. And so eventually you can't pay your taxes either on your land. And so what do you do? You have to mortgage your land. You have to mortgage your vineyard. You have to mortgage the family farm so that you can just get grain and now you're homeless. And so what's happening is the rich are just getting richer and richer and richer while simultaneously the poor just keep getting poorer and poorer and poorer and the gap between the two are just getting larger and larger. But that's not even the worst part. It gets worse. As you sell off your family land, as you sell off your farm, as you sell off your vineyard, and, and as you continue to not be able to pay uh, for grain, and so you've taken the max that you can on the loan, the only thing that you have left to do, and this is common, people would do this at this time, is what you do is you actually put family members up as collateral for a loan to get more money. And so what they were doing, usually they would start with their daughters, their female children, and you would set your, your female daughters up as collateral and you would take more money and loan more money at, at this huge interest rate. And if you couldn't pay back that interest, if you couldn't pay back that loan that you are taking so your family can eat, your daughter would be taken into slavery. And this was happening. They were literally losing their families, they were losing their farms, and they were losing their children into slavery just so they could get grain to buy food. And who's doing this to you? It's not Persia that's doing this to you. It's not, if we, from last week, the Sumerians or the Ashdodites or any of these, the foreign countries that are around. It's, it's none of these other people. It's your fellow Israelites that are doing this to you. They're the ones who are charging you huge amounts of interest, taking your family land, taking your children into slavery. It's your brothers and sisters. It's your fellow Israelites who have returned to rebuild the city with you. That's what's happening in this moment. And so what happens is these poor people that, that are, this is happening to, they come to Nehemiah and they begin to cry out to Nehemiah. And they begin to say, this is what's happening. Now, why did they think Nehemiah would care or do anything about it? What you have to realize is Nehemiah is the governor. The King Artaxerxes made him the governor of Israel for this rebuilding project. And what these people know who have had their children and their land taken from them, they know that we are all as Israelites subject to the Mosaic law. So the law of Moses that the Israelites were founded on and they were, they were put together and formed around this rule, these rules of law that bent toward the poor in their society. In fact, the Mosaic law forbids a Jewish person from loaning money to another Jewish person and charging interest. You can actually find that in Exodus 22, 25 and in Deuteronomy 23, 19 are the two places where you can find it says do not you can loan money but do not charge a dime of interest to your fellow Jewish person not only that but they had what's known as the jubilee laws the mosaic law talked about how every seven years you would cancel all the debts against your fellow Jews so you're, you're not allowed to charge interest, but you can loan money. But after seven years, even the loans that you made, if somebody hadn't paid back their debt yet, hadn't paid back their loan after seven years, you cancel the debt. And not only that, but they had something that every seventh seven years, 
So if you count that, 49 years, if you're following the math of that, there would be something called the year of Jubilee. On the 50th year would be the year of Jubilee. And in that moment, anyone who had lost their family land, anyone who'd had to mortgage their fields or their vineyards or their property, everyone would go back to their family land. And so essentially, you could amass wealth, you could gain properties, you could build your kingdom for 49 years, and at the 50th year, everybody went back to their family land. And the reason these laws were put in place, it was because this society was supposed to be bent toward the poor, so the rich could not just keep getting richer and richer and richer, and the poor get poorer and poorer, and the gap just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and the poor can do nothing about it. That's not the kind of society God wanted his people to emulate. And so over and over again, when you read the Old Testament, when you read through the Mosaic Law, there's this group of people that's just mentioned again and again and again. Literally, you almost can't turn a page of the, of the Old Testament without running into this phrase, the widow, the orphan, and the refugee among us. These laws are bent toward who? The widow, the orphan, the refugee among us. No matter what you do, don't, do not overlook the widow, the orphan, the refugee among us. Make sure you pay attention to the widow, the orphan, the refugee. You just keep seeing that again and again and again come up. And so these people know this. They know it. It's like, wait a minute. These are the laws, the Mosaic law that we're all supposed to be founded on. And so they come to Nehemiah because they know what's being done to them is completely wrong. Which begs the question, doesn't it? How did they not realize? I mean, they're all Israelites. They all know the Mosaic law. Nehemiah himself as the governor of Israel, he knew what the law said. How did he not see it? How did this happen? How did, they, how did they get to this point where they're charging interest and taking children as slaves and it doesn't occur to them at some point, wait, wait a minute, I think there was something in the law about this. How did they not see it? The way they didn't see it was the same way I don't see the pickles when they're right there in front of me. They were just overlooking them. Just, it's just this, people, this group of people that are just easy to overlook. They're not intending to. There's probably no intention to go down this path. It was just, oh, hey, there's a famine. I've got some money to loan there. I've got some grain. I can make the most of this. This this famine's actually turned out pretty good for me. It's an opportunity. I can grow my business. I can get ahead. I can take a step forward. I can get somewhere. These are people who had been in captivity for 70 years. It's like, this is great. I'm able to start moving forward. And in the process of building their own wealth and building their own uh, property, they just overlook this entire group of people. And so they come to Nehemiah. And so I want to look at how does Nehemiah respond to injustice? That's really what this chapter invites us to look at. And just like the last couple weeks, if you've been with us, Nehemiah gives us this incredible framework for how to respond in a godly way to injustice in our world and injustice when we encounter it in our lives. So how does Nehemiah respond to this moment of injustice as these people are coming before him? So this is verse six. It says this, When I heard their complaints, I was very angry. After thinking it over, I spoke out against these nobles and officials. That's the group of people who's uh, doing all this. I told them, you are hurting your own relatives by charging interest when they borrow money. Then I called a public meeting to deal with the problem. Okay, so the very first thing that Nehemiah does uh, to respond to injustice, the very first thing it says is he gets angry about it. And isn't that weird? Because a lot of times we, when we see the word anger in the Bible, we think, wait, is that actually in the Bible in a positive way? Like Nehemiah gets angry. Is that, is that okay? Is he allowed to do that? Because oftentimes we think when the word anger appears in the Bible, it's in some sort of a negative context. In the New Testament, the book of James says that man's anger, human anger, does not produce the righteous life that God requires. Oftentimes, anger is spoken of in a negative way, but this is a specific kind of anger that Nehemiah is experiencing here. This is what we would call righteous anger. Any, anytime there's anger against some kind of injustice that's happening, it, it's righteous anger. Jesus displayed this. In Mark chapter 3, there's a man who needs to be healed, and they're, they're there in the synagogue, and it's the Sabbath day, and all the Pharisees are watching him, and they're, and they're kind of hoping that Jesus is going to do something and heal this guy so they can accuse him. And what they're doing is they're stopping this guy from being able to be healed, and it says Jesus looks around at the Pharisees with anger. Like he's just seething with anger looking around at them because of the injustice that's being done to this man. If you 
are stirred, if you're to anger, if you are stirred to anger by some kind of injustice that's being done against another person in a way that they're being overlooked, and it is stirring you to get involved and take some sort of actual constructive means to resolve the problem, it might be righteous anger. And there's, there's an element to where righteous anger is not just okay, it's good. You, you see it displayed over and over again. But if you're angry about some wrong that's been committed against you personally, and there's some offense that's been committed against you, and that's why you're angry, uh, it, it might be righteous anger, but probably there's also some pride and some ego mixed in there as well. And so that's where you have to be careful. That's where you have to bring your motives before God. That's where you have to really think about the kind of anger that you're displaying. And is this righteous anger or is this not righteous anger? We think about our world. It's right for us to get angry against sinful practices that are done against other people, such as sex trafficking or abortion, racism, mistreatment of women, when we hear about these things happening in our society where there's an entire group of people being overlooked, we should get angry about it. There should be a righteous anger that boils up inside of us when we experience those kinds of things. But notice what Nehemiah does next. He gets angry, but then the very next thing it, he does, it says he thinks it over. He thinks it over. He doesn't just react out of his anger. He doesn't just fire off the angry email. He doesn't just go into accusation mode. Well, here, you did this. And he doesn't just go into attack mode and go after people in his anger. What the Bible talks about is in your anger, do not sin. And that's what Nehemiah does. He stops and he thinks it over. Uh, I'm actually kind of surprised that he didn't pray. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know well, the pattern you see again and again in the book of Nehemiah is every time a situation comes up and presents itself to Nehemiah, his first reaction usually is to pray, just to bring it before God in prayer. And it doesn't say that he prayed in chapter five here, but I wonder if he did just because it was such a, a regular practice of his. But, all, but what we do know for sure is he didn't just react. He got angry, but then he thought it over. He took time to think about how am I going to respond to this? Not just react to it out of anger. How am I going to respond in a constructive way to this? And so what he does after thinking it over, go ahead to that next one, is he goes directly to the source. He goes directly to the nobles and officials in private and he confronts them on what they're doing. By the way, this is his group of people. Nehemiah, as the governor, he was a noble. He was an official. So he goes to his own group of people, basically directly, and he confronts them and says, this is not right what you're doing. He goes directly to the source of the problem. He doesn't go talk to some other people and be like, can you believe what Bob is charging for interest? I, I can't believe that about Bob. I, just, I have some concerns I'd like to share with you about Bob and the interest that he's charging. You ever hear people talk like this? Every family has a member of their family that does this. Oh, and by the way, if you're sitting there right now going, well, my family doesn't, it's you. You're <laughs> the one doing it. <laughs> because it's human, re it's, it's, that's how we act a lot of times. When there's a problem, when something comes up, we turn and we go and we talk to other people. He goes directly to the nobles, he confronts them, and then he takes it a step further. He calls a public meeting of everybody. So the nobles, but then also the poor people who brought the complaint. He gets everybody together. And he says, we're going to hold a public meeting and we're going to deal with this head on. Now, let me ask you a question with that. When he calls this huge public meeting together, who is working on the wall? Not a trick question. Nobody. Nobody. He literally stops work on the wall so that they can all come together and confront this problem. It's like, until we've dealt with this injustice happening, nothing progresses. We don't work on the wall. We don't continue it. <laughs> Can't you imagine? There would have been people there going, wait a minute, this doesn't affect me. This isn't a wall issue. I'm here to build this wall. Why do I have to stop and come to some stupid meeting? And Nehemiah, literally, in the chapter before, I mean, they're getting attacked by these outside enemies, and not once in chapter four does Nehemiah stop work on the wall. 
you know, he, he confronts the enemy and he, you know, posts guards, and, but then they keep working, they keep working. He doesn't allow them to stop working on the wall. But in this moment, when there's this internal injustice happening, it's like, whoa, stop. We're all coming together in a meeting and nothing gets done until we've resolved this. That's leadership. That's good leadership. This gets confronted and we're not just gonna keep going business as usual until we have resolved this issue. So they all come together in this meeting because this issue is impacting this entire society. And this is what he says at the meeting, verse eight, the very next verse. At the meeting, I said to them, and he's addressed, in front of everyone, he's addressing the nobles and officials. We are doing all we can to redeem our Jewish relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners, but you are selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And they had nothing to say in their defense. Then I pressed further. What you are doing is not right. Should you not walk in the fear of our God in order to avoid being mocked by enemy nations? And then look at what he says next. I myself, as well as my brothers and my workers, have been lending the people money and grain. But now let us stop this business of charging interest. And what's interesting in that sentence, uh, scholars are divided on exactly what Nehemiah is actually saying here. Some people think that he's saying, look, I've been doing this too. I've been loaning money and grain. He doesn't say in charging interest, but some people are saying that that's what's inferred there. Some people would say, yeah, Nehemiah was part of this. He was charging interest too. He was making money on this whole deal. Other people say, no, that's not ex- explicit in the text. And so he was just saying, it's us. We all need to work together to solve this problem. But either way, what we can see is Nehemiah says, look, this is not just a problem I'm telling you to solve. Let us stop charging interest. This is, this is how we're gonna move forward together. You must restore their fields, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their homes to them this very day and repay the interest you charged when you lent them money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. They replied, we will give back everything and demand nothing more from the people. We will do as you say. Then I called the priests and made the nobles and officials swear to do what they had promised." So, so what I want you to see here is Nehemiah progresses through responding to injustice. Uh, he, after he gets angry, he thinks it over how his response is. He goes directly to the source. He calls this meeting. And then what he does is he proposes a solution. And this is so important because oftentimes that fourth piece, that's where we get stuck a lot of times in our world. When we encounter ju- injustice, a lot of times we have no problem getting angry about it. Uh, sometimes we think it over. Other times we just you know, go crazy and get angry and spout off about it. Sometimes we go directly to the source, but very few times do you see people actually propose a real solution. Usually we just get stuck in the blame game and we just get stuck in this sort of endless vortex of going around blaming and saying whose fault it is. And then these people come back and say, it's our fault. And everybody just gets stuck there and can, you know, obsessing about whose fault it is. The key phrase here is going forward, this is what we are going to do. You heard Nehemiah say it. Let us act this way going forward. He doesn't get stuck forever in the blame game. He doesn't just stay there. He proposes a solution. He proposes a way forward. And the way forward is to stop charging interest, repay the interest you've taken, return the family land, to basically practice jubilee, to practice what the Mosaic law called you to, and to to return children who had been taken into slavery. Just to begin to live into what God already called us to do. That's the solution he proposes. I want you to see here, uh, the solution he's proposing, it's not paternalism. It's not foreign aid that he's proposing. He doesn't go to King Artaxerxes, will you help you know, give the poor people some money? It's justice. That's the solution. Basically, the idea is, look, the poor will be just fine if we will just act justly and give them a fair chance. The poor will be, they'll be able to figure this out, but we've got to make it possible for them to do so by not just taking advantage of the situation that we find ourselves in and making things worse and worse and worse for them. That's the solution. By the way, that is the solution that we try to focus on as a church when it comes to all of our missions programs, when it comes to all of our, um, the ways that we partner in the world in areas of justice and uh, the fight against poverty is any way we can to be involved in something that's more of a hand up model versus a hand out. Um, something that's more uh, along the lines of, of returning justice to a situation that's been broken. And so that's what he's doing. That's what he's proposing. 
And so as we think about this, uh, maybe you look at those four things that were up there on the screen a moment ago and you just think to yourself, okay, that's great, nice story. What does that have to do with me? (laughs) What does that have to do with my life, with my world that I live in? And and, and so as we begin to turn this text toward ourselves and we begin to say, okay, what does God want to say to me and each one of us this morning? The the question we've got to answer is, how is God calling you to respond personally to injustice that you see in the world? How is God calling you personally to respond to issues of injustice when you see it, when you encounter it in our world? Uh, Can I give you a hint? Usually the answer to that question is not a how, even though it's framed as a how. Usually it's a who. Who is usually the answer to that question? Because what we do is we tend to answer that question by going, well, there's this issue and that issue. And and we think about issues in our world. That's where we experience righteous anger is when we hear about issues in our world. And we get angry and we go, well, how does God want me to do something with that issue? And oftentimes the way God wants you and I to respond personally and get involved personally with areas of injustice in our world is by answering the question, who? Who in my world am I overlooking? Who has my life positioned me in a place where I just don't see certain people? Is there any way that God wants to confront maybe assumptions that you have? Is there any way that God wants to begin to show you a group of people that you're overlooking? Who is the question? Who is being overlooked? Who does not have a voice? And how might God be calling you to to become a voice on behalf of others? Uh, one way is uh, through our missions partners here at Frontline. Maybe you're thinking, uh, well, what, what do we do as a church? Uh, we have a partnership with an organization called Ebenezer in Haiti. It's a discipleship training center and then uh, a Light of Hope. This is ran uh, by a member of our congregation. It's the, it, they disciple specifically women in the same area in Haiti. And again, it's, it's this model of helping people take the next step and become empowered. Uh, in our care point in Ukro, Ethiopia, we have a child sponsorship and IGAs, which are small business loans that are allowing the poor to step forward and take, uh, take steps to become empowered in the name of Jesus in the, in the spread of the gospel. We also have, uh, on this side of our, our building, some of you who are newer may not know, on this, this side of our building, we have what's known as the storehouse. It is its own nonprofit that actually uh, is an agent of um, returning back to the community and returning into nonprofit organizations across our community that are organized around the same model of a hand up versus a handout. And uh, we gave away over a million dollars of product over this last year through the storehouse. And uh, yeah, which is, which is really cool. And uh, the part of the storehouse that really we as a church oversee is called the Essential Store. It's an actual store where a couple hundred people from our community come and shop. Many of them are refugees. Many of them are people who are just in a position uh, where they are working toward moving into a better place in life. And through memberships, they can get essential items, which are really hard to find, personal care items, that kind of thing. And so uh, these are ways you can get involved. Maybe... Uh, God might be calling you to get involved personally in a different way. Maybe for some of you, he might be stirring your heart to get involved in the foster care community. Maybe God might be calling you to run toward the group of kids in our city who have been abandoned or who, who are in an institution who don't have a family. And statistically speaking, that is the group of people that will fill up our prisons and our mental institutions. That's true unless somebody steps in and intervenes. Is there anybody that that, that God might be calling you? Hey, maybe there's this group that's been overlooked. How might God call you to get involved personally? I just found out about this between uh, first service and second service. So first service didn't even hear this (laughs) because I literally didn't know what was happening. Um, There's an 11-year-old girl in our congregation named Addie who started noticing that there uh, there were homeless people around her house and around the church even, um, you know, here on the, the northeast side of Grand Rapids. And so she, in the spirit of the essentials, you know, <laughs> stuff, she began making these care packets, and her parents helped her. It has water, some socks, toothpaste, a toothbrush, um, 
some like snacks, like granola bars and stuff like that, and began handing them out. And then I guess she made like 25 of these and put them at the cafe for any of you to take. There's only 25 though. Um, and you can take, and you can also, uh, as a way of just blessing, it's like a, I think she called it a blessing bag, is what I was told she was calling it, uh, just to bless uh, uh, people in the name of Jesus. And so you can go pick one of those up if you'd like to. If you're a person who you know every day, you pretty much see somebody who's homeless, especially as the, warmer get, the weather gets warmer. Uh, what, a, what an amazing thing, though. This is somebody who just said, an 11-year-old girl in our congregation who said, how might God be calling me to get involved personally? I didn't even know about that. So... So, way to go, Addy. Let me read to you Nehemiah's personal response. What I love about chapter 5 here of the the story of Nehemiah is uh, Nehemiah doesn't just propose a solution for all of us to do, and it's sort of the, hey, you guys should all do this. He ends the chapter by saying, here's what I'm going to do personally. He talks about his own personal response to the injustice, and this is what he says. Verse 17, I asked for nothing, Even though I regularly fed 150 Jewish officials at my table, besides all the visitors from other lands, the provisions I paid for each day included one ox, six choice sheep or goats, and a large number of poultry. And every 10 days, we needed a large supply of all kinds of wine. Yet I refused to claim the governor's food allowance because the people already carried a heavy burden." So what is he saying there? What what he's saying is, as the governor, I had every right to charge people a tax, to charge the people a tax for my table. Now, in this time, officials, nobles and officials like the governor would be required to have a table and they would host. They would, they would bring people from other nations in. They would bring people from uh, usually people of important positions and they would eat at their table on a daily basis. And so Nehemiah is saying, as the governor w- with my table, I uh, had every right to charge a food allowance. I had every right to tax the people the poor, to pay for the food that was going to my table. That was a regular practice at this time. And what Nehemiah says is, I chose not to charge them. And he says, what I did is I lengthened my table and I began to invite more and more people, the workers, all the other people who are, who, are, who are serving here. And I began to feed them every single day and lengthen my table to include more and more and more. And I did it at my own expense. I didn't tax anybody for it. I paid for it. I spent the money out of my own pocket to make it happen. That's his personal response. Now, here's where the the sermon gets a little uh, dicey. (laughs) There's a danger right now that what we could do with this chapter and this passage of Scripture is we could take this and go, wow, that's that's really good advice. You know, Nehemiah was such a great guy. He acted, not only did he lead in this situation to propose a solution and and resolve this unjust practice that was happening, he himself got involved personally. That's awesome. I should follow his example. I should get involved personally. I should do, and and that's great. And, and, but, then, but the danger is we can begin to think, and if we all just do that, and if Frontline does that, and if all more people in our society did that, then poverty and injustice would just be solved. And that would be to completely miss the point of Nehemiah chapter five. What I want you to see is that Nehemiah doesn't fix poverty at all. He doesn't fix injustice, not even close. You get to the New Testament, you look at this same group of people, the same uh, nation of Israel that was formulated around the Mosaic law that was bent toward the poor, and they're doing even worse things. In the New Testament, they're acting even more unjustly, and they, they've completely overlooked the poor, even worse, and the gap between rich and poor just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Nehemiah didn't fix anything. He didn't resolve poverty. He didn't solve injustice. Not at all. So what's the point of this? What's, why are, what are we supposed to get out of Nehemiah chapter 5? If you were here a couple weeks ago when we started the series, you know what we said in week one is that the, the reason the book of Nehemiah exists, the reason we read it, the reason it matters for us today is because Nehemiah the person and the story of Nehemiah points to someone greater. Nehemiah couldn't solve poverty or an injustice, but Jesus came And just like Nehemiah, Jesus offered a meal at his own expense. At the expense of his life, his body and his blood shed for us on the cross. It's what we celebrate in the cracker and juice of communion is is the meal that Jesus offered at his own expense 
to redeem us, to reconcile us, and to make us uh, righteous again with God. And Jesus didn't come to just fight against poverty and injustice. Jesus came to end those things. And he did on the cross. Jesus came and at his resurrection, he announced the end of the kingdom of injustice and selfish greed and the end of sin, the end of death, the end of all of these things that we see in our world that cause us to just boil up with righteous anger. Jesus already solved it and he ushered in a new kingdom. And we, we are people, we are citizens of this new kingdom. And so we don't get involved with the essential store or the storehouse or Haiti or Ethiopia because we think we're gonna fix Haiti or fix Ethiopia or fix our city. We can't fix our city. We can't fix poverty. We get involved in those things because we are agents of the kingdom of God where those things have already breathed their last and they've already been defeated. The victory has already been won for us in the name of Jesus Christ. And so when we serve in those ways, what we are doing is we are testifying that things are not always going to be this way. The kingdom of God is thought about as already, but not here yet. It's how Jesus talked about the kingdom. It's already here in him. It's already been revealed. There is death and his resurrection, but it's not here yet. It's a kingdom that's coming. It's a reality that will eventually take over every reality. And we are the group of people that find ourselves living in harmony with that reality now. How had the Israelites overlooked this entire group of people? Because they had stopped living in harmony with the kingdom that they had been set up to be. How do we overlook people in our society today? We stop living in harmony with the kingdom that's coming. As the band comes, uh, we're going to sing. I'll close with this. My wife and I were foster parents for a year, and we... Uh, my wife still works and is involved in the agency and uh, working with foster kids. And what you'll see with kids in the system is this regular thing, if you've dealt with this, you, you hear this a lot, is a lot of times these kids, when they're uh, placed in front of a meal where there's plenty of food, is they will take food and they'll hoard it. Like they'll literally take food and they'll put it in their pockets. And later on, like you'll find piles of food in their room. And it doesn't matter how many times they come to a table where there's plenty of food and it's been provided for them and it's consistently there every single meal, they still will take food and they will hoard it and put it in their pockets and keep it. And so you hear this uh, talked about, it's a pretty regular thing. And so what's happening mentally in those moments is I'm thinking, okay, I haven't been able to count on anyone. And yeah, there's food right here in front of me. And yeah, for right now, but I can't trust that that food is just gonna keep gonna be there. And so I'm taking this food, I'm hanging on to it, I'm keeping it because there might come a day where things change and I don't have what I need. It's a scarcity mindset. And you see this happen a, a lot with them. And every time I hear someone talk about that, every time I hear a, another foster parent describing those, that kind of a, a thing happening, I think about Luke 14. Jesus in Luke 14 is asked by one of his followers, what's heaven going to be like? Literally, they ask, what's the kingdom of God going to be like? This eternal kingdom that's uh, being ushered in by you, Jesus. What's heaven going to be like? And Jesus tells what we know as the parable of the great banquet. You can go read it if you like. He's quoting Isaiah 25, this picture of this eternal feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus essentially says, you want to know what heaven will be like? I'll tell you. It's going to be like this great banquet with this table that just keeps getting extended further and further and further out. And it's going to be the best of meats, the finest of wines, the best meal and more abundance in that meal than you could possibly imagine. And all the people who didn't have what their needs were, all the people that didn't have those needs met, they're going to be invited at my father's expense. That's what heaven's going to be like. That's the picture that we're moving into. So the question becomes, how do you respond personally? You've been invited to be, uh, have a seat at the table and it was paid for at the blood of Jesus at your expense and all your needs have been met. How does God want to invite you to extend your table on behalf of others? And so Jesus, we just come before you right now. We thank you that 
even though we look around right now, what we see is a world of scarcity, a world of poverty, a world of injustice, a world of brokenness and death. Um, God, we just thank you that those things have already been overcome on the cross and there's nothing left to fear. And so we place our faith and our trust in you, Jesus. We can't solve these things. We, Nehemiah couldn't solve them. No one before you could solve them. But in you, we're invited into a kingdom where those things have already been overcome. And so, God, would you make us into agents of the kingdom who bear testimony to the already but not yet, to the way it already is and the, and the hope that we already have and the way it's going to be one day. Would you help us to work and to fight against uh, injustice in our world, not because we think we're going to solve it or we're going to fix it, but because we know it's already been fixed. It's already been solved. Allow us to be agents of that kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.